Dive into God's Word. Dig a little deeper. Discover the Bible's message for you today. Pathway to Paradise Ministries presents Deeper, your daily Bible study with Dr. Tim Rumsey and Pastor David Salazar. Thank you for joining us today. The title of our lesson today is The Coming of the Son of Man. We'll be looking at Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, as we continue our way through this fascinating chapter, we pray that you would guide our minds and our hearts to understand the message you gave to Daniel and the message you have for us today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Yesterday, if you were with us, we looked at the judgment that begins in heaven. That's described in Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. And I made the comment that judgment, that the theme of judgment becomes more and more important and prevalent as we work our way through the book of Daniel. Today, we're going to start down that road as we look at this coming of the Son of Man. We're going to see that it's actually part of the judgment. This is explaining another aspect of the judgment. Um, And I'll just make one more comment about yesterday's material before we move ahead. We also made the point yesterday that the judgment in heaven, uh, one of the reasons for this judgment is to respond to the persecution and the attacks of the little horn power. Um, That's brought out several times as the angel is explaining to Daniel uh, the meaning of what he has seen. But in what we're looking at today, this is another aspect, another reason for the judgment that, um, while it may be somewhat connected to this response to the little horn's power, it really focuses more on uh, or takes us down the road of what is God trying to accomplish in our lives personally? And this is one of the important things to remember when we study the Bible, and especially Bible prophecy. If we're only looking for events that happen out there in the world, um, you know, you know, many people look at Bible prophecy and they're they're focused on, uh, say, the Middle East and what's supposed to happen there. Or, or some people get focused on on China and you know the Eastern powers that they see in prophecy. Um, if we're only focused on external applications of Bible prophecy and we don't understand the message for me personally, for us, we're going to miss a, a, a hugely important aspect of what God is trying to communicate to us. Now, all of that is to set up what we're going to start looking at today, and that is a more personal understanding of the judgment. So let's uh, begin now by reading here, Uh, Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven, and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away in his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed." Now, verse 14 sounds similar to uh, some verses that occur later in Daniel chapter 7, such as verse 22. Um, The Ancient of Days came, and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High, and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. We have this um, reference to God's kingdom, which lasts forever, will never be destroyed. That comes again in verses 26 and 27. But the judgment shall sit, and they shall take away his dominion, that is the little horn, to consume and to destroy it unto the end. And then verse 27 says, And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. And so, going back to Daniel 7, 14, we see here, this is repeated uh, at least three times in Daniel chapter 7, that uh, the Son of Man is receiving a kingdom that lasts forever. And this is part of the judgment. In fact, in many ways, it's the culmination of the heavenly judgment, where Christ receives his kingdom. Um, Now, 
to help explain this uh, and work our way through these verses, I'd like to compare a parable that Jesus told in Luke chapter 19. And there's some historical uh, framework here that that we need to understand to really grasp what's happening. In Luke chapter 19, uh, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem uh, for the last time. And he knows that people are expecting that he will sit on the throne of David, proclaim himself king. That uh, expectation reaches its climax in the triumphal entry, which is uh, described in Luke chapter 19, beginning in verse 28. But immediately before this, in Luke chapter 19, beginning in verse 11, Jesus tells a parable um, to try to help people understand what his true purpose, what his true mission was. Uh, So I'm going to start reading in Luke 19, verse 11. And as they heard these things, he added and spake a parable, because he was nigh to Jerusalem, and because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. This was the expectation. Again, they expected him to ride into Jerusalem, or to arrive in Jerusalem, and set up the kingdom of God visibly on earth right then. Now, before we go forward in this parable, This has a striking parallel with the Advent Awakening in the uh, early uh, 1800s leading up to the 1840s, and especially 1844. There were uh, Christians around the world from every denomination that expected, were waiting for Jesus Christ to come back at the second coming, um, based on their understanding of the cleansing of the sanctuary in Daniel 8, 14. Uh, most Christians then believed that the sanctuary represented the earth and the, the cleansing of the sanctuary of the earth must be the cleansing of the earth with fire at the second coming. And so uh, this was the reason why so many Christians around the world leading up to 1844, um, and not all of them had zeroed it down to 1844, But uh, they were all looking to the 1840s as the time when Jesus would come back and establish the kingdom of God visibly here on earth. Uh, Now, this parallel is important because obviously Jesus didn't come back at the second coming in in 1844, but something important did happen in heaven. And Jesus is trying uh, to help us understand that through this parable as well. So there's a dual application to this parable. It's an immediate application to what was happening there in Jerusalem the last few days of Christ's life, but it also applies prophetically to what was happening uh, in 1844. So let's go on now in the parable, Luke chapter 19, verse 12. He said, therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called his ten servants, and delivered them ten pounds, and said unto them, Occupy till I come. But his citizens hated him, and sent a message after him, saying, We will not save this man, not have this man to reign over us. And it came to pass that when he was returned, having received the kingdom, then he commanded these servants to be called unto him, to whom he had given the money, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Now the parable goes on, but we'll stop right there. Okay, one guess, the nobleman represents Jesus. That's right. And he says here in verse 12, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and then to return. He brings that out again in verse 15, that when he was returned, having received the kingdom. In other words, the nobleman or Jesus does not come back until he has received the kingdom. Now, again, think about this historically in in terms of the people's expectation there uh, in the last week or two leading up to Christ's death. They expected Jesus, again, to set up God's kingdom on earth and to receive his kingdom as they perceived it right then and there. And he's trying to tell them, no, 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 (laughs) that is not, first of all, this is not my kingdom, this earth, you know, the, the, the empires of earth. My goal is not to take over the Roman Empire. Uh, and and to set up that kind of kingdom. In fact, he had told Pilate, didn't he? My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my my servants, my disciples would be fighting with swords and spears, but they're not. And so Jesus is saying, my true kingdom is in a far country. 
And that far country is, is heaven. That was where he was about to go, wasn't it? After his resurrection. And he says, I will receive my kingdom in that far country in heaven. And after I have received it, then I will come back. That was the immediate application of this parable. Now let's look at the prophetic application. Uh, Again, leading up to the 1844, many people believed that Jesus was about to come and set up God's kingdom visibly here on earth at the second coming. And instead of that event happening on October 22, 1844, something important happened in heaven. And that event is described in Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. So let's go back again. Here is what happened at the beginning of the judgment in heaven in 1844. Verse 13, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven, and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom. Here it is. This noble man, uh, our Savior, Jesus Christ, he is receiving his kingdom in heaven. This is the coming of the Son of Man, not to earth, but to his Father's throne to receive his kingdom, that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. Now, this brings up an important point. What is Christ's kingdom? You know, the Bible says he already owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Um, He created this world. Ultimately, everything belongs to him already. He doesn't need buildings. He doesn't need land. Uh, He doesn't need possessions and treasures, does he? Uh, He is not after these kinds of things that uh, every other kingdom on earth has, has been seeking. There's only one thing that Jesus is not assured of. There's only one thing that he does not uh, already possess unless it's given to him, and that is your heart and your decision for him. This is why it says in Daniel 7 verse 14 uh, that when he receives his dominion and glory and kingdom, the definition of what that kingdom is comes right, right after this, that all people and nations and languages should serve him. Now, obviously not Not everyone will serve Christ. Some will decide never to do that, and they will be lost, according to the Bible. But his kingdom is made up of those that do make the decision to serve him, those that do make the decision to surrender their lives to him, those that do make the decision in this life right now to surrender their lives, to trust themselves to their Lord and Savior. These people make up his kingdom. And when he has received this kingdom, when people have made their final decisions, then, according to his parable in Luke 19, then he will come back um, because he has received his kingdom. I wish we had more time to look at uh, the the things brought out here, but uh, we have about one minute left. Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14 explain this incredibly important aspect of the judgment, which we'll we'll look at even more closely next week as we study Daniel chapter 8. The judgment, yes, it includes God's response to the little horn power, but it also includes a very personal application. Um, uh, Will I give my life to Jesus Christ? Will I allow him to be my Lord and Savior completely and totally without reserve? That is uh, the decision that needs to be made in the judgment. And the judgment is the time period when God is especially working in people's lives to help us make that decision. We still have a high priest in heaven. He is still our intercessor. He is still our mediator. He is still the one that can give us the strength and power we need today to make the choice for him. So I encourage you to do that and uh, know that God will help you as you make these decisions. Well, thank you for joining us today, and please join us again tomorrow. Deeper is a production of Pathway to Paradise Ministries. For more Bible study resources, including books, DVDs, and study guides, visit pathwaytoparadise.org or call toll-free 855-HIS-TRUTH. To support this ministry with your tax-deductible contribution, visit pathwaytoparadise.org or call toll-free 855-HIS-TRUTH. That's 855-447-8788.